So hi, everybody. Uh, I think we will get started. And then uh, if more people will join us, then um, that's great. It's uh, fantastic to see you all. Thank you so much for coming along um, to celebrate the launch of these fantastic two new pamphlets uh, by Michaela Copeland and Jacob Anthony Ramirez. Uh, my name is Neil Monroe. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the uh, director of Oxford Brooks Poetry Centre, uh, where Ignition Press is based. Um, I just want to say a few words about the format before we get on to uh, what's actually uh, the best bit of the evening. Um, I'm going to say a few words about the centre and the press uh, and then each editor, that's to say me because I was uh, working with Michaela and then my colleague Claire Cox will introduce the poets and then they will read for about 15 minutes each. Uh, Michaela first then Jacob uh, and then I'll also invite, don't miss the end because they'll be like, it's a bit like the credits uh, in, the, in sort of the, uh, in a movie uh, where you want to stick around for the credits, really good credits, um, because there's going to be an extra poem uh, from each poet at the end uh, before we wrap up around eight, uh, or maybe slightly before. Um, so the press itself, Edition Press, was established in 2017 uh, with the aim of being a press with an international outlook, uh, which publishes original arresting poetry from emerging poets. And we've now published uh, 19 pamphlets, four of which have been shortlisted, uh, sorry, have been selected as Poetry Book Society pamphlet choices. Uh, one was shortlisted for the Michael Marks Award for Poetry, and last year the press itself won the Michael Marks Publishers Award. Um, I'm just going to stick a few things in the chat. If you don't know so much about the Poetry Centre or you'd like to find out more, um, there's lots more information about us on the website, um, and you can find us on social media if you're not already following us there. We also run a weekly poem initiative where you get a free poem every week uh, from an independent press. And um, we've just started a newsletter as well. So if you want to keep track of uh, our events, please sign up for that. Um, and of course, you can buy all the pamphlets. And Claire's going to very helpfully put a link in the chat now uh, to our pamphlets page, where um, you can find anything that uh, remains in print, of course, uh, especially uh, you might pay particular attention to um, McKenna and Jacob's pamphlets, which are now available uh, via our online shop. Um, so before I introduce Michaela, I just want to say uh, some thanks to a couple of people who have made the pamphlets and the launch possible. So particular thanks to Flora Hands uh, at Carline Creative, who designs the covers of our pamphlets, here they are, most recent ones. Um, and also a uh, very big thanks to Luke Allen of Studio Lamont, uh, who is a really good poet, but also a fantastic a typesetter who's typeset of the work. It really helps having a poet as a typesetter when you're typesetting poetry, uh, particularly when it gets sort of complicated and they, they don't just sort of say, ah, oh, forget about the lineation. No, Luke pays really close attention to the lineation that is really terrific. So we're really lucky to have him. Um, I also want to say big thanks to Claire and to our managing editor of the press, Les Robinson, uh, whose dedication to the press and the Poetry Centre more generally uh, has enabled them both to thrive. They've been fantastic. At the press, uh, McKenna and, and uh, Jacob will tell you, we make a point of working really quite closely with our poets from the initial stage of their selection through to quite an intense editing period, maybe too intense uh, at times, uh, through to publication and beyond. Um, so thank you very much to Claire and Les for their real commitment, continuing commitment to this project. Um, and many, many congratulations to McKenna and Jacob. Um, it's been a real privilege working with them both. Um, and even though this is an online launch, I hope that you're gonna feel there's a, a supportive community and audience out there. If in fact you're in the audience, you'd like to add some comments, feel free to, um, I think you can stick some stuff in the chat, um, feel free to do that. Um, or feel free to you know, email us afterwards if you wanna pass on some messages to the poets. Um, in the interest of accessibility, we're gonna be sharing the poems as we go along. Um, and closed captioning uh, is also, should also be available to you. If it's not, I'll turn it on. It is on. Yeah, uh, if you need to use closed captioning, please do. So uh, enjoy the readings. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let me introduce Michaela. Um, it's been a real pleasure working with Michaela uh, on her pamphlet, Finishing School, which has all kinds of different meanings, as you'll, you'll find out she needs. Uh, from the start, she had a really clear sense of what she wanted to do with the collection of poems that she'd been assembling in this Abbasidarian form, which is a form I didn't know very much about, actually. Now I know lots about it. Um, but the title of the poem, basically, uh, the title of each poem uh, corresponds to a different letter of the alphabet. So we start with A, we go through to, to Z or Z. Uh, you might think this would make things kind of predictable, um, but actually, uh, although yeah, there are 26 poems uh, in the pamphlet, um, and it does run from A to Z. But one of the things that's most exciting about Michaela's work, I think, is her interest in playing about with that form um, and challenging predictability more generally, pushing back against the status quo, particularly uh, when that comes to thinking about gender 
and how women are expected to behave in society. Uh, one of the reasons these poems are so important, I think, is that it takes on, they take on questions about education um, and privilege, um, and they show how we're still constantly limiting young people, young women uh, in particular, in the way that we speak about and enable learning. Uh, it's a beautifully crafted collection of poetry, um, and Michaela is, as uh, one of the people who's added an endorsement to the pamphlet, uh, Deborah Landau has said, uh, Michaela is a poet we'll be reading for years to come, and I'm sure that's absolutely correct. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Michaela for the first poem. Thank you very much, Michaela. Thank you so much um, for everything and, and for that introduction. I'm just going to jump in. Um, yeah, the, the pamphlet follows a speaker through, you know, the kinds of letters of the alphabet as she's learning about womanhood and power. So I wanted to sample some of that alphabet today. Um, we're going to have three from kind of the early childhood education world, and then uh, a couple from high school kind of adolescent, and then get into three from the undergrad kind of higher education sphere. So we start with A for Apple. Apple. All you have to be is good. Good is a dog that sits and stays. So the teacher nods, ascending. Bad is an apple in the eye. In school, you are so quiet, you can play the quiet game. Then the mind begins this squeaking like a mouse or a garden gate. The next poem is Bug. My mother came home with her uniform on and the line where the hat creased her forehead. When she saw that the wall was alive again, she went to get the vacuum. I was standing on the table on my toes to get a look. The gap where they came in was like the seeping of a wound. All day, I'd watched them trailing in, their quiet congregation. I liked the pattern of their backs, a red that softened everything. Soon she was behind me with the phone against her neck. No, she was saying as she plugged the vacuum in, the less real power that he has, the more he'll try to use it. She handed me the nozzle, went into the other room, I held the sound outside myself and sucked their bodies up. And the third poem kind of rounding out this childhood section uh, is, is Egg. Holding to my mother at the lip of the public bath. Look, these men have penises. I tell her and she laughs, a laugh that skims her shoulders like the loosing of a robe. I've learned the hidden body parts, want them to know I know, the diagram, the terms, I trace one letter at a time. In school, they warn about the girl, the unexploded mine she found alone, how she dug it up and brought it into class. The changes we are taught will come on fast and set us ticking. My grandmother spells out a trick to navigate the system. Always spend the night with your friends when your husband's on a mission. A woman who stays in the house alone at night must want what's coming. That summer at the swimming pool, the air was heavy, humming. Sex was breaking over us like the breaking of a shell. How that slick missile couldn't miss would always find you home. And that leads somewhat naturally into uh, our, our section about teenage kind of adolescent learning. Um, so this is not. The stretch of concrete off the road where the new builds were never built, where in the dark and his dad's black car, we kept the engine off was the place of our necessity the hush where we would hide ourselves, past highway lights, the railway bridge, the cows in their low blue barn. And when we parked, 
With swollen words, an automatic chuckle, he would eager and unbuckle, I would shift myself to task, ever willing subject of the list I had to tick. And most nights that was it, a clutch, a minute then of rest, a fog of breath we'd smear around the windows with our shirts. But one night we reversed, he wanted, Yes, he really did. He was sure he could. I said he could. I had no hints to give. I just watched him from inside me. I tightened in the grip, that slip knot. I could never slip. I couldn't let myself slip. Uh, this poem, another alternate longer title, uh, might be so much depends on a undergrad acceptance letter. <laughs> Uh, and so this is, you know, our speaker is uh, kind of contemplating, contemplating uh, what, which way this is going to go. Um, so this is letter. You can't climb a ladder while looking back. Not for the field and its shuddering flowers. Not for the stream you soothe to your ankles in. It's water slow and cold or the pen where a swayback mare is pacing, waiting to be fed. Not for the neighbor's house, all boarded up, so light comes out in slat. Not for the quarry growing paler as the moon comes close, the walls you filled with expletives and promises you meant. Not for the lightning bugs all quivering in sex numb glow. Not for the red where a distance ripens. The ladder creaks, but won't give way a step that's only wide enough for you to sit alone. And a letter you still haven't opened. You aren't prepared to know, but from here, this life already looks like the sketch of a place you've left, how the lines all progress to their vanishing points, two roads leading out of town. The next poem finds our speaker uh, in undergrad, exploring different degrees of freedom on the scholarship, you know, living, living that life. <laughs> uh, so this is Oregon. Alone in a distant city, keeping scrupulous receipts. I justify my coffee to a board I'll never meet, grant myself a new indulgence. Loneliness is an open text, a spigot with a metal grip that I turn off and on. Like an archive, I'll take anything. I picnic on the lawn. Every day I use the language I'm ashamed to have perfected, how I gesture to a need, knowing the gesture is enough. At the entrance of a church, I touch the basin out of habit, render hours unaccountable, my fingers dripping blessings. In the sex shop on the corner, all the toys are on display. In memory, they hang in lines the pipes of a giant organ. The next poem is kind of meditating on uh, considering graduate school and what that might take uh, to, to be a woman who is prize winning in that way. <laughs> so this is prize. Take for example, Sor Juana, no fear of showing off. Opened up for interview, she holds them all at bay the way a royal galleon might fend off a few canoes. Sweat pools down her upright back as men draw in around her. My hair grew fast, she will later write, my understanding slow. In first dream, a soul becomes untethered from its spine. Centuries later, Sylvia Plath considers a graduate scholarship. Only a million people want them, no competition really. And Flannery O'Connor writes to God, I do not mean to be clever, although I do mean to be clever on second thought and like to be clever and want to be considered so. Plath decides she wants the same, prepares an application. The pragmatist, she secures her psychiatrist's recommendation. A big striptease, the selection board, will shove in to see. In Fulbright Scholars, Hughes recalls her hair for what it hid. Prize, the pursed, the pursed lip, how it means to open by force. The college used to make each woman stand nude for the camera. It was said to teach them posture, 
how to better hold the self. And this last one finds us in a post grad school world where uh, we're exploring all manner of possibilities of uh, how to navigate uh, through imagination with a little bit of a sci-fi twist. <laughs> so this is yawn. The time travelers crop up everywhere. Their costumes are very good. They're careful, they've had the briefing. Look away when she starts looking back. There are more in crowded places. There is normally one on the train. They pretend to be kids or creeps if they want leeway for the staring. The tickets they are sold determine how close they can get. At the bar, they watch her drinking. At the school, they watch her read. All the highest payers look over her shoulder at the screen. Thanks to convention, they aren't allowed in her most private moments. She figured it out a while ago. She yawns to check their attention. She watches mouths pop open in response like baby birds. So as not to disturb the timeline, she keeps doing what she would do. Uh, thank you. That was really cool to share. <laughs> Oh, that was brilliant. Thanks so much, Michaela. What amazingly crafted but powerful moments those are. Thank you very much for letting us in that amazing place. Wonderful. Um, I'm so happy to be here this evening. It's always a pleasure and a joy to bring you things into the world, these wonderful, wonderful pamphlets and these wonderful poets. Uh, I had the um, joy and privilege to work with Anthony, uh, Jacob Anthony Ramirez. Uh, when we, I, when I, when we first saw his poems, uh, it was a no-brainer, absolute no-brainer. They're, they're vital, they're brave, they're absolutely outstanding. But you, you'll hear a poem, which was the first poem that we read, and it is, uh, he manages to work things just perfectly in terms of the, it's visceral, but exquisite. It's powerful, it's personal, but... Uh, collective as well. The poetry um, was fantastic. I learned so much working with it and through it. There's a specificity about culture, particularly about um, sensory experiences. There's so much to do with the visual, with colours, with, with colourfulness, with sound, with music and the resonant speech and, and language. So much that, that um, is filtered through that particular lens that Jacob brings to his work and his life and what he hopes to say. There's food, there's music, there's family, there's, there's violence, there's love, there's, there's danger, um, there's an unpacking of the kind of machismo culture, how that works and how there's the sort of feminine power that's held here as well. So, so the line between all these competing and potentially mm, combative elements is trodden so Amazingly, I learned so much. Thank you. What else do I have to say? There's an exuberance here. It generates a force field. I was so happy to be drawn into that force field and that world. So um, I am not going to stand between you and this work anymore. I have a huge uh, and ongoing respect and admiration for the person, the poet and the work. So it is my joy to hand over to Jacob to read from his new pamphlet, kitchen boombox. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> on, on that good note, I'm like, good night, enjoy your evening, just go, <laughs> let's go pick up the pamphlet. Um, no, it's an extreme pleasure. Um, <clears throat> and I actually, um, I wanted to just say thank you to Oxford Books, Brooks um, Poetry Center, to Neil, to Claire, um, to Lancaster University, to my own mentors, uh, Owen Walls and, and Sarah Corbett. Uh, Sarah's running the Sylvia Plath Festival right now uh, in England. And so I know she's busy, but I hope she's out there listening. Um, yeah, this is a pamphlet about family. Um, in Spanish, we have this thing we call chisme. Chisme is like gossip. And so I'm letting you into the gossip. It's about food, family, music. Um, it's a way for me to sort of <clears throat> come to grips with losing identity, with losing culture, but gaining it. Um, and I think. I think, um, Michaela, we were meant to read together because Sor Juana, at the end of your last poem, 
Um, she was also Ramirez. She was that was one of her other last names. And I'm I'm beginning with Zed, where your um, pamphlet was uh, Ibisidarium. So it just sort of strange that way. But this first poem is about my last name, and I'm sort of living through the world with uh, losing Spanish and sort of having the identity of, of Latinx and Hispanic. So this is called uh, Z. Z. Your name tag flashes in the fluorescent light. Read me again. The veteran teacher is a woman who studied Spanish in Mexico City. Her eyes hold tight to the tail of your name, the Z. A salted glass for tongues to trill towards fluency. She flits her lips and says, Debes hablar el español más hermoso, meaning you must speak the most beautiful Spanish. Her breath soars the air in snaps of rhythm, a barrel roll of flying R's. You do not answer, only catch the tail feathers of her phrase. The one your grandmother crowed, clutching her bamboo spoon in the kitchen, regurgitating letters in your ear. You stutter and wonder if she would make the same assertion about a black man or an Asian man, or fuck this, the Z. You explain the study of third generations, the abandonment of culture, a language plucked and boiled, your diaphragm, an empty cage, once flew with phonemes, a rainforest, orchestral and lush, you lose either way, not speaking, not forming the accent. You mention your father, he wanted his son to speak American, opportunities, a free life. The woman smiles and says, well, he did a good job and disappears. You nest in your classroom, your box of Shakespeare waiting to be unpacked. The next poem <clears throat> started as a really long poem inspired by um, a poem called Indigo by Ellen Bast. Um, my father passed away about 10 years ago um, after a really hard relationship with him. And so this poem in many ways felt like it needed to be um, written um, for closure and for so many things to sort of come to terms with um, being a son, being a father, um, and not being <clears throat> um, the product of my father's abuse. And so um, this is called Do Not Resuscitate. Uh, I'll read it straight through. Do Not Resuscitate. My mother told my father that she could no longer live with his abuse. In days, he drove off like a hearse playing end of the road by boys to men. In weeks, he made a life with a woman who could have been my mother's twin, hair highlighted in yellows of daffodil, medallion, and urine. I learned to hate men around a card table of Chicanas, whose husbands cash checks at liquor stores on Friday nights, drinking Coronas Clamado on orange porches with blunts burning with blues. My mother and I would play backgammon, eat Taco Bell burritos, while she spilled about my father's affairs. The first, a mistress in a Motel 6 with Janet Jackson bangs and bangle bracelets. I imagine her cosmic eyes sirened my father into her greasy glow. He kept that key to commemorate her warm dark, kept collections of keys from one night stands in an Indian jewelry box with pickup lines on business cards that read, I'll buy you a drink if you want to fuck. I kept him in a locked box for 20 years after he tried to kill me the night we watched Buddy Guy live singing Damn Right, I Got the Blues, bending his Stratocaster strings until he broke. He promised not to drink that night. He stumbled in dark rums, mouthing lyrics into saliva stars. He paid two prostitutes my mother's age to ride their tits on my back before he drove us home those hundred miles. His mouth mourned my mother. He called her a bitch, swerved his truck serpentine in desire for death. I prayed for God to kill us. We lived. The morning after, he denied all he'd done. When he called to apologize, I never answered. Not the year I failed Spanish. Not the year I bust tables, scooping any pasta appetizers into the trash. Not the year I buried Bobby and Jose. Not the year the Twin Towers fell. Not the year a tank toppled Saddam's statue. Not the year I asked a woman to marry me in a dark hotel room. 
Not the year my wife asked me to forgive my father for myself. Not the year I drove so slowly I stalled the car, our newborn son asleep. Not the year he called and begged to meet my children before he died. I answered the year he told me about the Oaxacan girl and their one night stand. She kept the baby, moved back to Mexico in a Toyota truck tanked full of fuel and formula. Maybe my father wanted a woman like his mother who prayed over broken rosaries, who chopped onions, chiles, bounced newborns on her bruised hip. I wanted more than to lug the blood of my father's family. I wanted to give my father's God a second chance, but I could not translate this into Spanish in the ICU. Not to Silvia, the woman who introduced herself as a love of my father's life, not her, the one he called for rides after his very last DUI, the one he called before his body succumbed to coma, the one I told about my father singing Stevie Wonder to us in silk dashikis. The hospital chaplain translated Sylvia's words as, we should try to save his life. There was no perfect place to say it's time to let him go. Not in the family room with its seahorse wallpaper or the cafe cold with its table stained. I grew tired of his wreckage. I grew tired of reliving his regrets. So when he left no will in how to end his life, I spoke like my mother, enough, I said. It's time for him to go. Um, the next poem I'm going to read is a poem called Tomales. <clears throat> Tomales, if you don't know, is a, um, a really special food to the Hispanic Latinx community. Um, it's something that we make seasonally um, for uh, special events, Easter's, um, for Christmas. And it's sort of um, a wrap made with uh, cornmeal, and different types of meat, but it's a family affair. So just so you don't know, I know the cross Atlantic um, audience uh, may or may not know, but uh, tamales is a kind of a food that's really important. This is dedicated to my grandfather, Adolfo Soto Tafoya. You know why Chicanos eat tamales for Christmas? This is how grandpa starts the holidays. We laugh. Though we guess his joke was true in the depression, scarcely enough food for the eight working children his youngest sister wrapped in blankets, buried. We talk and mix our masa by hand, listen to gossip. I, he died? She remarried? Grandma speaks, assembles, and assigns us our jobs. Kids on corn husks spread the masa, not too thick or thin. No doubt. My mom fusses. Your auntie, psh, no help at all, nada. Grandpa says, get it? Something to unwrap. We haven't made tomales since they passed. The next poem I'm going to read is um, very much inspired by, by my grandfather, who, as you learned in the last poem, um, survived the depression, worked on a Japanese farm um, in the Central Valley of California, which is uh, rich with uh, beautiful migrants working very hard in the fields. Uh, when he came back from the war, he made homemade wine is one of his hobbies <clears throat> for, for himself and so many others. So this is a character based on him. This is called Maestro Milo and his homemade wine. Maestro Milo had a little cellar of cherry wine. He drank most bottles with his war buddies. He gave what was left to newlyweds, parents expecting firstborns. Tino, the neighborhood barber, said Milo's vino cured his dermatitis, absolved the red of his rashes, Skin pure as porcelain, he escorted his mother to Milo's front door. Minutes later, Senora Ayala skipped off like a jackrabbit in a cotton field. By Saturday, a line of believers circled Milo's house demanding his magic. Sigh heavy, Milo carried his last crate to the porch, dabbled droplets on his white handkerchiefs. One by one, he swabbed the sick. Achy muscles eased like oiled hinges. Scars vanished in seconds. Diabetic ulcers filled with flesh. Cancer spots wiped away like drops of salsa fresca. When the last bottle lay in his palms, the ill hovered. The broken wept. 
Not enough to cure the waiting. Milo dug a mouth into the soil with his boot heel. The ground glugged the liquor gone. A cherry tree sprouted in April. It bore no fruit, only insurance cards on leaves of pink paper. The next poem is um, a dedication, uh, really a eulogy for Frida Kahlo, um, who, as we know, so beautifully painted the story of her body in many phases uh, through her paintings. So this is in a way um, a, a eulogy for Frida. Frida's body. Under the clouds born of jungle, the wind whips her hair. The parrots plant seeds of orchids and poppies, pineapple sage. Her tears cure the cactus, silver with withering. Her waters wash the blood of an afterbirth, the bull of Thalia's. Toucans lift her spine, horizon of bone. Her breath calls and hunt for a mate like coyotes snarling a dead fish. Her breasts lay halved in the gut of the white. Her acids seduce new lovers. Ovaries harmonize a requiem. The blue wind whistles through her carcass, ribs roaring beneath the heavens. Um, <clears throat> this is um, a celebration. This poem is um, a way for me to sort of think about in light of my father's death, um, about my own time on earth. It's a love letter in a way to California, the way I grew up in my California in the 80s and 90s. And so um, it's sort of a way of me sort of visualizing when that time comes, what I want that party to be, what I want that fiesta to be. So this is called If You Find Me Dead in California. Sign the cross on my torso with kombucha tea. Pour gin and juice over my grave. Cash roll Snoop Dogg to Izzle lyrics faded with yo. A backing band of mariachis, guitarrones go. Crow espanol. Skaters kick flip on my stainless steel casket. I hire a Whitman professor to Lizard King the sermon. Bonfire with sex wax surfers, Hala Ginsburg's howl. Park your taco trucks, carne asada con salsa fresca y Cadillac margaritas. Horchata for the kids. Oye, lowriders spark and scrape in a procession of chrome springing shocks, bass high, treble low, bumping more bounce to the ounce from Frisco to Mexico. Um, the last poem I'm going to read <clears throat> is the poem about um, being seen as other, about being marginalized in America. Um, it's about what love feels like and looks like when you are being watched as a minority in America. Um, this poem is called uh, Last Barbecue in America. I glare at blondes in star-spangled spandex, not for their skin, but for Allison drowning my brain. You remember the invisible man? Here, the paddles lap with impulse, swish and splash with nakedness among the oak trees. The barbecue sizzles and smoke trips in alarm in dark chambers of my heart. Remember the tests we took in school? Darken the odd one. Naked bodies drip like fangs in caves, salivating for the ones who do not fit. From a year, or yards, who tells the difference between a ghost, a cloak, a fire, a sail? Smell the season, the steak, the sear never heals. What does hunger smell like in America? Who craves in a country full of freedom? Dorito bags fly at a family's feet, little carcasses. I like a bald eagle for polypropylene as a conceit. The sun skunks bottles of amber beer over jokes about this is us, and I am perfectly aware of my place. In my mind, I'm in Chicago to gaze at the punches of paint in Suraz, a Sunday on La Grande Jetée. You love it as much as muddy waters 
and I do too. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, that was terrific, Jacob. Thank you so much. And, and Michaela, wonderful reading. I Really such a, a pleasure to hear you both read and, and make the pamphlets come alive. So we're going to conclude now uh, just with one more poem from each poet. So I'm going to invite Michaela back um, just to read a poem called Middle, which appropriate enough is in the middle uh, of her collection and the Abyssinian. And then Jacob will come back and read uh, his poem Shopping just after that. So uh, Michaela, back to you. Brilliant, thank you so much. Yeah, we're gonna end in the middle, um, but it's I think one of one of my favorites. So thanks for indulging that. <laughs> um, this is this is middle. My mother and I are both eighteen. I'm driving. She's hitching a ride. Her stops a couple hours off. It's been a stifling summer. No, she doesn't mind the windows down. It's fine if I go fast. She holds her bag between her knees, leans the seat back. All the fields are full of passing time, a second crop of hay. We chat, she has this laugh. We trade particular opinions. What makes a view worth stopping for? Would you rather be lucky or rich? We're both leaving home for college. We hold our breath across the bridge. We talk about each house we pass like future lives to live. There's really no good time to tell her. We close the middle distance, the road beneath us groaning where the concrete's wearing thin. The radio fades out and in with songs that we both know. And we go on like that for a long while, both humming, both facing ahead. Thanks so much, y'all. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michaela. And uh, Jacob, do you want to come in and, and read your final poem? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, thank you. And brilliant reading, Michaela. Um, yeah, just fantastic. Um, <clears throat> this is a poem called Shopping um, that kind of cascades my experience shopping with my mother as a kid and then as a um, husband. Shopping. For years, my father suffered from jealousy, interrogating shadows and smashing glass. He asked me, where is he? The man your mother slept with. He assigned me to spy on her, bolted windows with rusted screws. My eyes shut. My mother guided me through the supermarket between the halogen lights and the white tile my hand a wing under sprinklers, misting cantaloupes and peaches. Then in the pinto beans, there's silk skins pebbling in my palm. A produce man in a red apron asked my mother if he could take her in his mint Corvette, like the butcher who wanted her hunched over his steel counter laying out prosciutto. Like my father, she taught me lust waits at the door for a warm home and an invitation to sit for a bite. Last night, I ran to the store for milk and basics for the week. I returned home in the slow rain, lowering the heft of bags on the hardwood floors, the thin knit of my shirt clear over my chest. I let you unwrap me. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, it's been a real privilege to hear you and uh, I hope everybody has enjoyed it. Um, please, I highly encourage you to um, check out these pamphlets. Um, please find them on our website. Just look up our pamphlets page, in the, uh, which was in the chat, or uh, just search for Oxford Brooks Poetry Centre and Ignition Press and you'll find the pamphlets page and you'll find the pamphlets there. So please get hold of them, read them and let us know what you think of them. Um, big thanks again to uh, Claire and uh, huge thanks to Jacob and Michaela uh, for reading so beautifully this evening. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care and uh, we hope to see you all soon. Thank you. <laughs>